in a time of legend and valor, there was a fighter, a wrestler, whose name was renowned across the land. Now this wrestler entered all the championship there is, and he won all of them, and he won all these accolades and the trophies and the treasures, and, and he became famous far and wide. Then there were the most powerful kingdoms of the world. They all wanted to recruit this wrestler to be on their national team. So all the kings came to his door with a different bid to attract him to play for their team or to fight for their team to be the wrestler of their nation. It is like NFL draft, right? The, you get the pick. He's the MVP, you know. Any, any offer will go. So one king and sa- came and said, hey, I'll give you three chariots full of gold. Would you come and be in our team. Another king said, I will give you my palace. I'll go and build another one for me, but you can have the royal palace. Would you come to our country? Another king said, I'll give you half the kingdom. Another king said, I will give you my daughter in royal marriage. So you get the kingdom and you become the king and all of this different offers, different bidding started for this wrestler. And everybody waited in suspense. Who is going, he going to pick? Which team he is going to be in? And after a week, the decision was announced and everybody was surprised. He picked one of the most insignificant, powerless kingdom. So people were upset. What in the world? What did this king offer to this wrestler that nobody else could offer. So they, and then, what did you get? What was the offer? Wrestler said, well, this king said, he will make me a foot soldier in his army. I said, what do you mean? Like, you know, you don't want the princess? You don't want the kingdom? So he said, see, a true wrestler is a fighter, a fighter, a true fighter, a true warrior doesn't need the gold and the kingdom and the princess. What a true warrior wants is an opportunity to fight. The growth that comes through continuous comeback, the thrill of a challenge, the the honor the honor that comes through struggle. That is what a true warrior wants. The best reward for a job well done is more work to do. I'll say that one more time. The best reward for a job well done is more work to do. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10. Luke 17, 7 to 10. Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, When he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you may eat and drink." He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. 
We have done only that which we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I know this is a tough parable to read. (laughs) And I bet you haven't heard a lot of sermons on this parable. I haven't heard any. (laughs) Because it depicts this cruel, ungrateful, demanding master. Now, if this story happened in California... The labor laws are very clear. (laughs) We can sue this master to smithereen. We can drag him to the cleaners. Because that is not the way you treat your servants. Yet, the master, who is supposed to be the symbol of God, was treating this master, uh, this slave, like this. See, first of all, we have to remember one thing. To look at the parable, that the kingdom of God is not like California, okay? The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. What do I mean by that? In the kingdom of God, the king himself is a slave, okay? The master himself is a servant. In Matthew chapter 20, this is the Matthew with two T's, as Richard said. (laughs) Matthew 20, 26 to 28, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The Son of Man, the Master Himself, The inheritor of the heavenly universe came here not to be served, but to serve. So the master himself is a servant in this kingdom. Right? See, this is why when we talk about radical generosity, the series of radical generosity, we can be generous from our human nature. It is in human nature to be generous, like I said last week. But radical generosity doesn't come from human nature. It comes from divine nature. Last week we saw that we love because God first loved us. God so loved the world that he gave. So we are giving because It is in God's nature to give. And if we are the children of God, we have to reflect the nature of God. So giving is in the nature of God. That's why we give. That's why our generosity is called radical generosity. We don't give like Bill Gates or Brad Pitt give. We give like Christ himself Gave. We are reflecting the nature of God. In the same way, we are serving not because we are generous with our time and talent, but it is in the nature of our master himself to serve. It is in God's nature to serve. That's why we serve. Now that's the difference between generosity and uh, Radical generosity. See, every believer is a missional agent. Everybody who is sitting here is a missional agent. And the job of a minister is to equip other people to do ministry. This is something I repeat very often in our staff meeting. Because it's very difficult for people to get it. Because in the Western world, we always consider we hire pastors to do stuff and we pay them so that they can perform on a Sunday morning and we get the ticket to come and enjoy the show. That is the way, the culture, that is what we have inherited from osmosis. 
But nobody gets paid to do ministry. Nobody gets paid to do ministry. Ministry pays for itself. We get paid to do just the mundane task you all do. Because our job is to do, not to do ministry, but to equip you for ministry. I don't know, you're, sir, you, look, you look stunned and surprised. <laughs> so let me read a verse. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 11, 12, 11 and 12. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Okay, these are the offices. For what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So the job of a minister is not just to do ministry, but to equip, to equip the saints to do ministry. See, that's why the most exciting thing that happened to me is when people are out there and doing things that they are called to do. Now, I'm happy that you're coming here on a Sunday morning. I'm happy that you're, some of you are taking notes. And I'm happy that some of you remember my sermon better than I do. But that's not what I'm looking for, which is a good start. It is when you reflect the nature of God by loving as Christ loved, by giving with a cheerful heart and was serving with a generous spirit. I have a picture of a group of us from one zone, and they think of the Arcadia zone, I believe, and they went to the, the City of Hope Hospital. A group of us, see, uh, a, I mean, this, is, this has just happened a couple of weeks ago. There was another one happening in Alhambra. These are something happening underground, in, in, under the radar, in a way. And this is what church is. This is what makes me exciting. This is when I know that I'm doing my job because I'm equipping the saints. We are equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. That is what ministry is. That is what the church is. If we learn one thing, at least one thing from COVID, that's what it is. We are all missional agents. Everybody is a servant including the master himself. And when I leave Lake Avenue Church, I want to be known as a person coined the term honorary staff. We have a new, <laughs> I don't know if California labor law approves this, but we have created a position called honorary staff, which is basically we have people coming here and working with us they go through the same vetting process like any employees do, uh, you know, they do. And uh, they get an email address, they get an office, they get everything except money. We don't have enough money. But they come here and they do stuff. We have Val Yeda right now taking care of all our children's ministry. We have Gary Mittelberg taking care of our, our benevolence ministry. We have Chris Higgins, who is their honorary staff, taking care of our rentals and leases and things like that. These people work just as hard as any other staff person uh, do here, uh, but, but they are called honorary staff because by vocational ministry is my big word. I want you to learn that from me. You know, some pastors are known for the buildings. You know, they have their na buildings named after pastors, which is fantastic. But I want to be known for coining this term honorary staff and bivocational ministry because I always consider myself that way. See, when I was uh, young, I was in my early 20s. That's just right about after that I became a Christian. And I had a very colorful career. I was working as an engineer. I was making a lot of money. Uh, so I was always taught to give my tithe. So I, I've been meticulous about that. So that, was, that part was there. But that was not enough for me. And I wanted to serve. Like Rich asked today, what is your position? Oh, I write this check. No, that's not the question. The question is, what is your position? Where are you playing? You think you can write a check and just, you know, be condescending in some way to, be, to become charitable to God and God is sitting here waiting for your money to come? No. What is your position? So it bothered me as a young man, early 20s. I didn't know what to do. I had a very busy life. 
I was an engineer of a multi-million, uh, multinational company. And so then I realized that I had a motorcycle. I always had a motorcycle, even in India. So I, I, I realized that I can do something. See, in India, back in the days, there were not enough pastors, there were, there were not enough uh, missionary, or, well, evangelists who would be preaching the gospel. We didn't have enough people to do that kind of stuff. So most of the pastors were itinerary preachers. They will go from one church to another church. They'll preach in one church, they go to another church, they go to evening, another church. Weekend, they are really busy. And also evening, they go from one town to another town. And this is, I'm talking about in the 90s, we didn't have a good public transportation system. This is before globalization. And so I found that these people are quite often, they are walking long miles and they will be hitchhiking, these pastors, and they don't really get paid. Uh, they're, they're, nobody gets a salary in India for doing ministry. And they are just, they are depending on what we call love offering. Uh, but most of the time it is more love than offering, you know what I mean? So, so I thought I can be useful. So I, I started running some kind of a Uber bike, you know. So I approached some of these pastors and I'm happy to, to, to give you a ride. I'll drive you from one place to another. Because weekend I have a lot of time and then the evening too. So I will ride many pastors from one place to another in India. So they, they sit in my, in my back and then I'll drive from one, one city to another and then I'll become part of their, their meeting and I'll be sitting in the back seat because I'm the driver. In India, there's a class system. The drivers cannot even sit in the front. They have to sit in the back. It's like a chauffeur. It's a very class-oriented, structured society. So I'll be sitting, uh, sitting like this and, you know, anyway, these preachers will go and preach and, and some of them became very very, very good friends to me. And the things I learned while we are driving in the motorcycle, that's what you're hearing today. What I learned from these ministers on our bike ride, that is way more valuable than whatever I learned from seminary and their life, their thoughts, and, and, and things that evolved out of this interaction is what is really helping me in ministry. People ask me, Pastor Matthew, how long will it take for you to prepare a sermon? I say, how about 30 years? How about 30 years? This is 30 years in the making. I didn't flip the Bible and came up with the sermon for this week. These are things that God spoke to me while I was riding my motorcycle. The angels sitting behind me and whispering to me. And then I remember one day, one of these pastors was not had a serious, severe uh, uh, throat pain. And he said, hey, you know, I don't think I can speak today. Can you speak for me? <laughs> and I said, no, I was terrified. He said, no, just take 10 minutes. I'll take the next 15 minutes because the sermon is minimum one hour in India. So, okay. So he said, <laughs> so he said take 10 minutes. Oh, I still remember that that moment. That's the first time I, I ever faced a crowd with the Bible. I was sweating profusely. I was shivering. I had notes all over my Bible and I, I pretended like I'm reading the Bible. I was not actually reading the Bible. I was actually reading my sermon notes because, you know, that 10 minutes, like almost at seven minutes, I almost passed out. That's what I felt. And I remember that. And then he would push me. Hey, he, you did a good job. Then you should do it next time. Then others, so I, I became a preacher for hire, like a, like a stepany, right? Like, you know, what do you call the, yeah. So I became that second line person, B team, would go from one church to another. And nobody would pay me because they knew that I was making a lot of money. Sometimes they take money from me for going there. They come to me with their projects and all that kind. That's what I was doing. So I would go and do whatever, every weekend while I was working as an engineer, while I had a full-time job, I was an amateur evangelist. I was an amateur pastor going from one place to another. Nobody paid me. I didn't think of it because the kingdom of God, the work of the kingdom was a reward in itself. And I remember one of these churches actually invited me. They said, hey, we have a CYA, college and young adults group meeting, like a big meeting for the whole region coming on. They have a speaking competition, preaching competition. We are looking for a judge. Can you be a judge? So I went and I, I, was, I became one of the judges. And I remember sitting there, all these young people coming from different parts of the, that place, 
and going one after the other to speak and they speak so eloquently and reading the Bible, dissecting the word and one of those people who walked in was a 19-year-old girl named Joanne. <laughs> See, I got the kingdom and the princess. That's what happened. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> see, let's come back to the scripture. So, <laughs> so when you look at the scripture, when you look at this parable, there are two kinds of ministry happening. It says there is a servant who is either plowing or tending sheep. So the kingdom of God, the work that is happening in the kingdom of God can be divided into two different categories. Either, you are either plowing the field or you are tending the sheep. What, what does that mean? Plowing the field means preparing the land, right? Preparing the land for sowing the seed of the word of God. That's what you are all doing. Whether you recognize it or not, when you go to your workplace, when you go to your college, when you go to your business, whether it's JPL or Hollywood, it doesn't matter. You are actually plowing the field. God has sent you to plow the land, to prepare that land for the gospel to enter. Now that's why this is an important thing. We recently started two cohorts. One is we call STEM cohort. You know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I believe. Uh, so it is just for, because this Pasadena is the, such an epicenter of whatever is technologically happening in the universe. So we have a lot of people from Caltech and JPL and others here, and we have a group of people because it is important to equip them because they are just as, it, just in ministry, as much as we are, all are. Prepare the land. Then we have the next cohort, it's for Hollywood people, people who are in the film industry. We have a group of around 50 to 60 people. They are meeting in different places. We keep it a secret, but if you want to be part of this, let me know. Because the plan is to plow the land, make the land ready for the king to arrive. Now the next kind of ministry is what we often do in a church, which is tending the sheep. Jesus said, you have a servant either plowing the field or tending the sheep. That's a second category where you are nurturing the kingdom of God. That's what you're doing here. You are ministers. You are royal priesthood. We are a congregational church. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. And there are so many people here, and Rich, like Rich said, there are so many people making these things happen. Just yesterday, we had an amazing breakfast session for our ushers and our greeters and our parking lot ministers. Awesome to see around 50 people, and there was supposed to be more, but we wanted to appreciate them. We want to equip them because they are just as in ministry as we all are. At the end, I asked Pastor Beth to give them a charge, and I asked Pastor Beth to pray for them, and she used this word. She said, greeting all oh, parking lot pastors, and the priest of the hallway. I thought that was fantastic. That's what she called them. Our parking lot pastors and the priests of the hallway. That's what they are. See, that's the ministry of tending the sheep. The question again is, which position are you playing? And all are equally important. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. So there is a ministry of planting, then the ministry of watering. What you are doing out in the culture, in your workplace and all that, you are planting. And what a church ministry is mostly watering. Our job is to water what you have already planted. It is equally important. There is no difference between clergy and laity in the kingdom of God. We are all part of the royal priesthood serving the same king and we are the servants of the master servant there is. Now, the most important thing is that third part, right? So the, the servant does all the serving and then come back and then the master invites him 
to a third layer of ministry, which is serving at the master's table. Now, to understand the cultural context of this, see, the master, it looks like in the story, the master is really hungry. He says, okay, don't take time to rest. I was waiting for you. Come and prepare yourself, prepare a, a dinner for me and change your clothes and serve at the table. It looks like the master was holding on till he comes so that he can eat. He's so hungry. That's what is very obvious from that parable. And part of the reason is, when you understand the cultural context, the masters won't let all the servants to enter into their kitchen. The masters won't eat whatever any servant cooks. Only a specific servant is assigned to do cooking because that is the most important task in the house. Reason being, as you know, in the olden days, the rich landlords suffered a lot of attacks from people. There was always people to kill them, the kings and the rich people. So there was always a chance for sabotage. And back in the days, it's much easier to kill somebody by poisoning. So the king will, or the masters will always wait for the trust servant to arrive so that he can go and cook the meal. Not any servant. The master will not trust any servant. It has to be a trusted servant who can come and prepare the meal so that I can have that meal. Now that changes the story a little bit, doesn't it? Because that story is not about the cruelty of the master. It is about the loyalty of the servant. It is not about a request made by the master. It is about the attitude of servitude. It is a place of honor. Serving at the master's table is a place of honor. It is unique and it's profound. And this servant actually yearns for it. See, there are different kinds of servants in, the, in that times, you know, back in the days. First, there is a kind of servants who are daily hires, you know. They come and they do the job and then they get their daily wages and they go back. They do their eight hour, 10 hour shift and they go back. Then there are servants who will lease the land of the master. You know how the leasing system works, right? Whether it is the crops or the field or sheep, whatever, they lease that and then they share the profit with the master. So they are still under the master, but the relationship is different. And then there are actual slaves per se, or servants who are either bought, or they are actually bought through the war, and they became slaves through the war and all that kind of stuff, different kind of ethics back in the days. But these slaves or these servants, the third tier of servants, has to be freed after seven years. It's very clearly written in the scripture. After seven years, the servant will be freed. But then we see the fourth level of servitude where this servant feels that this master has been so nice to me. I have such a profound relationship with this master. So it's not slavery or servitude in the Bible is very different from what happened in America or rest of the world. Sometimes the servant and the master can have such a deep, intimate bond. You know the story of Joseph, right? Joseph's owner, Potiphar, trusted him with everything, including his wife, in a way. So that kind of relationship, that, that very, like, almost like a familial relationship will be born in the process of serving, depending on the attitude of the master or the servant. But the point is, at this point, the servant will say, seven years, I'm going to go free, but I love this master so much, so that I don't want to leave him. I just want to give my life for him. I just want to be with him forever. And that person does this ritual. I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and my children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl, and then he will be his servant for life. And this is what we call a bond servant. 
a bond servant. A born servant is a servant who has willingly, voluntarily declared his allegiance to the master for the rest of his life. Now, a true master will only trust this born servant. The true master will always wait for the born servant to come so that he can get his dinner because he is the only one he can trust. It is like your friends, right? Like when the friends come, some of them, they are allowed to be in the, in the main, in, in the guest room. Some of them are allowed to be in the family room, but only your cross, closest friends and family can come into the kitchen. Even today, it's true, right? Because you, can, you won't just let anybody enter into your kitchen. So in the same kind of relationship, serving at the master's table is the highest honor you can receive. See, that's what we see in the story. The relationship, the, the profound intimacy in the, in, in the kitchen that is happening between the, the master and the servant. Only them, they are together. And there the master can be completely free, completely trust him. Now that is the relationship to, to which we are called. See, when you go to the Old Testament temple, there was an outer court. Outer court is where all, everybody can come. It's also called Gentile court. There everybody can come to that outer court. But then there is a place called inner court or the holy place. Only the ministers, only the Levites and the priests can enter that place. That is a deeper level of ministry. Then you go to the innermost sanctum, which is the holy of holies. That is the kitchen. That is where the ministry is really cooking. <laughs> the innermost sanctum, the Shekinah, God's glory, glory is manifesting. Not everybody can, not every Tom, Dick and Harry can walk in. Not every pastor can walk into that place. Only one person, once a year. There were hundreds and hundreds of Levites and priests at that time. So they were all hoping one day, one day, one day, I hope I will go to the inner sanctum. I will be able to serve at my master's table. If only there were many priests were born, wished for it. They died without ever getting the chance because it was decided by drawing a lot at the time. I don't want to go into the details study more. The point is, going into the inner sanctum, serving at the master's table is an honor. It is a privilege. It is not by the master's command, but it is by the servant's choice. Because the servant you see here is not just a servant who is plowing the field. He is not just a servant who is pastoring the sheep. He is a warrior. He will bite the bullet for his master. He will save the life of the master. He will give his life for his master. That's why the master is waiting for him to come. That is what a bond servant is. That is why he has pierced his ears. So that that's a symbol that I am sold out for my master. So that's the beauty of that parable. The question is, the question is, have your ears pierced? Are you still plowing the field? Good job. Are you still tending the sheep? Good job. But the call is to be a bond servant, to be sold out. There are many people who are like daily Wages, servants, they come and they sit here. They can be here for 20 years or 30 years. They are very faithful people. They write their check and they, they contribute to the ministry. They are wonderful, but they go back. They go back. They're not connected to the church. I know I used to be one of them. So <laughs> believe me, because many people come to Lake Avenue Church, including me and Joe. And one of the reasons we came to Lake Avenue Church, this is a big place to hide this is a good church. We wanted to go to a big church to hide. We didn't want to talk to anybody. We didn't want anybody to talk to, talk to us. Now look what happened to us. So, <laughs> but then there are a lot of people who work 
on, on leases, right? Like there are people who are actively involved in certain aspects or aspects of the ministry, but they, they are leasing it in the sense that I will work only, I will contribute only to missionaries. I will not give any money to general fund. Or I will give only my, my money to music program. If you have a music program, let me know. I'll write a check. Well, which is fantastic. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not discouraging you from doing any of that. But the point is, again, what is the purpose? There is a limited involvement in the kingdom of God. That's not the point. You're, you're still being a least servant. But I'm inviting you to be a bond servant, to be sold out for the cause of the kingdom because only, only then we can truly enjoy the nearness of the master. I'm telling you, the most beautiful thing you can have in the world is to serve at the master's table. You and the master alone. <laughs> no real warrior <laughs> will think of it as a chore. Nobody will think of it as a job. Nobody will think of it as a cruelty. It depending on your, the way you look at that story, right? Like the, that changes the story upside down in a, in a way. Because it was not the command of the master. It was the choice of the servant because that servant is a warrior like this warrior we saw in the first story. A true best reward, a best reward for a job well done is more work to do. The best reward for plowing the field, the best reward for tending the sheep is, is to, for them to come and to minister at the master's table. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Now, I'm going to give you a, a time of reflection. This time, we're not going to sing a song as a response song, and I'm not even going to pray right now. But we are going to do a time of reflective prayer, and we are going to do it differently. <laughs> you know, when you came, you all got this survey. So this is a survey. If you haven't received it, if you raise your hand, the ushers will hand it over to you. If not, there's a, yeah, there's a QR code. So you can do it online. You can zoom in using your phone. And you, so the next three to five minutes, I want you to take some time for you to reflect on those questions. Only 10 questions. By the way, the name and the email and the phone number are optional. So we are not trying to recruit you to do anything. We have more people than we, we really need in some way. But this is for you. We are trying to help you here. I and mean, if you have no, because see, at the end of the day, even when I was, I was talking about when I was a young, young boy and I was getting involved in many things, and what I see in our culture today is that many people don't really have something meaningful to do. They do things and another thing and another thing. But see, that's why when I was a kid, I, I was that young guy riding around with all the pastors in my, in my back. I never suffered from anxiety or depression. I was not worried about what's going to do because my life was so meaningful in so many ways. I'm not saying that that's the cause of all of this. But in so many ways, we can have something more meaningful in, in our life by getting involved in something bigger than us. That doesn't have to be the church, by the way. I'm not asking you to volunteer for the church. That's not the purpose. We are working with seven other Christian not-for-profit organizations in this area. We can connect you with some of those people. They are all looking for people to help them out. Maybe it's one hour a week. It doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, it's going to change your life. I didn't read that in a book. That's my life. You can see it. I'm the witness. It is going to radically alter the way God has created you and it is going to help you move, over, move forward to the de your destiny. So I want you to take the next three to five minutes to do that survey. If you don't have a pencil, the ushers will give it to you and, uh, you, or you can do online. Again, at the end of the survey, I'm going to come up and close in prayer and then I'm going to let you go with benediction. And again, the name and the contact is optional. But if you give your name and contact, we will try to help you. Otherwise, we will just pray for you. We don't know who you are. So please take some moment. That's your reflective prayer time as we continue.